There's lunch afterwards, so you have plenty of time after that. We're carrying on in our series in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're in Matthew chapter 13. We're looking at these parables of Jesus. Jesus uses parables to unsettle, to challenge, and sometimes offend your understanding of the way things are and should be. And that's his goal. It's to disorient our thinking so that he can reorient our perspective to be centered on the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew uh, 13, Jesus tells seven parables that are meant to give us windows through which to see what the kingdom of God is like in our world. Parables are these extended metaphors. Parables invite you to see the extended metaphor as a home that you need to enter into and take up residence. You can't just walk by the home and understand it. You have to enter into it. You have to walk through it. And I want to suggest that what Jesus invites us to do from within this home is to look out at these windows, to see the world in a new way, in a way that aligns with reality, with the kingdom of God. And so today we're going to look at this first parable, it's commonly called the parable of the sower. This is what it says, Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 3. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to, show, to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. And they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And then if you jump to verse 18, Jesus gives us the gift of his interpretation of this parable, where he says, Listen, then, to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who makes you known. Let us hear from Jesus today. We invite you to speak to the deepest parts of us, not just our minds, but our hearts. Not just our hearts, but all of us as we hear from you, Lord, and respond in trust and obedience. Rescue us, heal us, forgive us, and restore us, and then empower us by your Spirit so that we may live the way you have called us to, so that we may join you in walking and talking and experiencing life in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. This morning, I've drawn some material from a couple guys named Daryl Johnson and Tim Keller. And I want to ask this question, what is this parable all about? What's it focused on? We're told there's a sower, there's seed that he throws out, and then there's four different kinds of soil. This parable is about the kingdom of God, and how it advances. In verse 19, it tells us that this parable is about people who hear the message about the kingdom and how they respond to it. Jesus is actually talking about his ministry here. Since the outset of his ministry, Jesus has gone about announcing that the kingdom of God has come and is showing what it's like through his teaching, through his miracles. We read that in the Sermon on the Mount, and then the events that follow that, all the different people who are healed and restored like a sower throwing seed. Jesus is the sower. The sower is Jesus. And the seed is his good news. God's message about God's kingdom having come. And the soil are human hearts. Now I want to ask a few questions 
And before that, I just want to highlight a couple of things that stand out. One is one about the sower, and the second is about the seed, and then we'll talk about the soils. The first is the sower. The sower is not operating under the normal ways of our world. If you think about it, the sower, if you are a farmer, would you just throw your seed anywhere? Don't you think about the good soil, where you know it's going to grow? The sower throws seed indiscriminately. The sower, Jesus, is not throwing a seed on areas where the soil is most fertile, fertile alone. He's throwing it everywhere. If I were gardening, there's not a chance you would catch me throwing seed on the path. I wouldn't want to waste it. Are you kidding me? I paid for this seed. Now I'm just going to throw it on a path where I know it's going to get picked up. Throwing it in areas where the seed didn't have very much of a good chance didn't, wouldn't make sense to me. I want the best chance. I'm going to skip those areas and just pick the best soil only. Which begs this question, if you're a king announcing your kingdom and it's going to be established on earth, why would you announce it to anyone and everyone? If you were going to start a movement and wanted to get a good start on it, why would you announce it to everyone? Wouldn't you focus on specific people you know would be receptive to your message, the ones you think would be, you'd have the most success with and what you're trying to achieve, the strongest, wisest, most strategic, the wealthiest, most educated Jesus is throwing seed on the path, on good soil, rocky soil, and soil with thorns. Is he wasteful or careless? No. He's purposeful. He does what the Father calls him to do. He is full of compassion and care for people. And I think this means that the state of the soil, despite the condition of a human heart, the seed of Jesus that he throws is unlike any seed that's ever been planted. If it was already determined that the rocky soil, the soil full of thorns, or the footpath would never bear fruit, that couldn't be changed or transformed, would he waste his seed throwing on those areas? Jesus believes the seed can take root and bear fruit even in the toughest circumstances. His words can take root in the heart of a human being, even when the odds seem to be very low. It's no ordinary seed. It's no ordinary message. But the second thing that stands out is the way that Jesus likens his kingdom, the kingdom of God, to a seed that a sower is throwing out. The seed, the kingdom is like a seed, not a boulder. Tim Keller highlights this difference. The kingdoms of our world and the, kingdoms of, and the kingdom of Jesus are vastly different. And over thousands of years, we have seen human kingdoms boulder their way through, conquering their enemies through war and domination. Revolutions that bring violence and use violence to bring about their goals, coercing people into an external transformation, submitting to the rule of a particular ruler. And something similar, you might say, hey, well, we're a democracy, so we don't, we're above that. But something similar does happen in our democracies. If 53% vote in favor of one person, or 51% even vote in favor of one person, and the other 49% haven't, that other 49 still got to submit to that person. That the democracy is this coercion of the majority. The kingdoms of the world are like boulders, but Jesus does not announce that his kingdom is like a boulder. He says his kingdom is like a seed. When a boulder comes, it smashes everything in its way, but the seed comes in very quietly. You wouldn't even hear it. The boulder revolutionizes the ground externally. It changes the way that things look, but the seed transforms the earth internally. The boulder comes suddenly, forcefully, coercively, but the seed comes and does this organic transformation, this gradual, gentle change. The boulder will break the land, but the seed transforms the soil into a garden. It reorients and rechannels the nutrients and minerals and, and provides life in this area. See, the boulder doesn't really change the land. It just breaks it with sheer power. Only the seed transforms the land completely. That's something the boulder cannot do. And we've seen that with human kingdoms over and over again. It can't fully transform people in the way they were meant to. And this is what Jesus' words can do. This is what Jesus has the power to do, to completely transform your heart and even transform our world. And that's what Jesus is after, is a transformation of hearts. And in the language of this parable, fruit. 
a crop yielding 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. You planted one seed, but from that, many other seeds are born and go out, which grow other plants. The fruit of living a life without reference to God and his words, his ways, is strife, anxiousness, death, and decay. It's what Adam and Eve choose in the first garden. And it's what you and I do when we live without reference to his words. But the fruit of being with Jesus, learning from him, is a different kind of fruit. What kind of fruit? Well, Jesus has taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's shown us what, kind of, what this looks like through his miracles when he restores people. The fruit of coming into contact with Jesus and trusting him, entrance into the kingdom, is comfort and grief. A life oriented around being rightly related to God, yourself, others, and the earth. A life oriented around his rule, his ways. A life marked by loving your enemies and praying for them. A life marked by delighting and looking for opportunities to give your money away, especially to those in need. A life marked by peace and trust in God's provision. A life marked by simple, honest, and genuine prayer. And it's a life marked with the presence of reconciliation rather than contempt. A life of nonviolence and more. His miracles show us that the fruit of coming into contact with Jesus and coming to him in faith, believing that he can restore, is restorative. That every person that Jesus heals in Matthew 8 and 9, they come believing that he is able to heal a body, to restore their health, to set them free, to cleanse them from sin, illness, shame. And the fruit is actually this healing, this joy, this praise. Tim Keller will say, the kingdom of God is nothing less than the power of God in heaven, entering the world to heal every alienation and every brokenness in every dimension of human life, whether it's social or economic or racial or emotional or physical or psychological or spiritual. Man, that sounds amazing, but if that is the case, if, that's, if Jesus is expecting fruit, why don't we see this every time? Well, Jesus will outline four conditions of the human heart, likening them to different kinds of soil. And three of them are like warnings to you and I. Whenever the Bible talks about a heart, it's not simply just talking about your emotions, like what you feel. It's far more than that. It's talking about the core of who you and I are. It's talking about the control center of your desires, your thoughts, your will, your emotions. It's what defines us and directs us. One guy calls it the motivational headquarters. That's your heart. And so the first soil is this hard heart. The second soil is shallow, rocky heart. The third soil is this divided heart pulled in many directions. And the fourth soil is this receptive heart, someone who hears it and understands it. And so I just want to walk through these, these four soils. The first soil is this first warning of a hard heart. Jesus says, anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. Jesus is actually warning us, saying, look, there's this grave danger when you have a hard heart because neutrality won't actually work with me. You are with me or you're against me, he says earlier. And now we're beginning to see Jesus explain some of why that happens. He warns that whenever we hear his words and remain unwilling to embrace him, the enemy comes and takes the word away from your heart so that you won't believe and be saved. In your neutrality and unwillingness to respond to Jesus, there's an enemy who is opposed to the kingdom of God and preys on hard hearts. He seeks to further entrench your indifference. The reason is because Jesus threatens everything that this enemy stands for, everything that this enemy wants. Jesus is a threat to. The gospel announces that the kingdom of God has come, and that means that the enemy's reign is over. His kingdom has to come to an end. Jesus threatens his very existence, and so he will do whatever he can to ensure that hard hearts stay hard, bitter, angry, indifferent, that they stay that way, that disappointed hearts become hopeless hearts and stay in that place, that anxious and weary hearts remain anxious and worried. And one of the easy ways 
to make sure that this happens is to simply engage with God on a mind level, on an intellectual level, and no more. No emotions, nothing else, no desire. It's just trying to just fully and only think about him with your mind. It doesn't work like that with God. It needs our whole being. The second warning we're given is of this shallow hearts. The seed, Jesus will say, falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. When you embrace Jesus, you will eventually encounter trouble. It's just part of the deal. Following Jesus and follow him long enough, and you will face trouble or persecution. That's part of it. Yes, there is healing. Yes, there's forgiveness. Yes, there's new life in the Spirit. All of that. But there's also trouble that comes. And if your heart is shallow, then when you'll face this tension when you face trouble. You'll question whether Jesus really is the real deal. You'll ask, are you really the Son of God or should I look elsewhere? John the Baptist, when he's imprisoned, had this vision for what the Messiah was supposed to be, and he thought he was on the side of the Messiah, and yet he finds himself in prison. And so he asks Jesus, are you really the one who was promised to come, or should we be looking elsewhere? Because this experience doesn't seem to align with what I thought you were about. And some of us experience that all of us at some point actually will have that moment where we're going through something where we're like, Jesus, this cannot be what you wanted for my life. And we begin, if we don't deal with that uh, in a healthy way, we will begin to actually turn it and be like, I'm not actually sure you are the real deal, Jesus. Now, this word uh, trouble that Jesus uses is helpful to make sense of in the Greek. It's this word thlipsis. It means pressure and sometimes crushing pressure. Follow Jesus long enough and you will experience pressure, sometimes crushing pressure. It's the pressure when two forces press up against one another and begin to exert the energy to overcome the other. Because of this, what happens when you enter into the kingdom uh, of God is that you will encounter Kingdoms clashing with the kingdom of Jesus. You will go seeking to live as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, and your way of living and being will be different. It will butt up against the other kingdoms of the world. You will experience pressure. This is why Paul, when he's teaching new Christians in the city of Antioch, tells them in Acts 14, that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Trouble and persecution. And Jesus says, because of the word. Not because of you. It's because of the word. It's because of the tension of the message of Jesus. Wherever Jesus went, announcing his kingdom, bringing the kingdom, the there came up this tension, this conflict of butting up against these other kingdoms. They don't gel, so this pressure builds. Tension is felt. You experienced that. Jesus encountered that tension in his earthly ministry, and you and I will too. We should expect that as we seek to follow Jesus and embrace his way, we will face pressure and at times even persecution. But Jesus also gives a third warning when speaking about the soil that is thorny. The divided hearts pulled in many directions. He says in verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. This is a, a heart who has heard and believes, but because their hearts are divided, they have grown stagnant. There's no longer growth. There's no fruit. Our attentions, our longings, our motivations, our loves are divided. It's like you got one eye looking this way, but another one looking over here. That's what a heart does. And if a heart is like that, it's like a house that is cluttered. There's so much in the way you can't actually operate and live in the house the way you're supposed to. Jesus says it's because of two things, the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth that choke the word, the seed in your life. 
What does Jesus mean by these two things? Well, let's start with the easy one first. Deceitfulness of riches. I feel like we can, we, we can track with that, right? Deceitfulness of riches. We get this. Money and wealth can easily lull us into a, a false sense of security, making us apathetic, encouraging us to live without reference to God. It tempts us to believe that our sense of wholeness, our sense of satisfaction, and full delight come from our stuff, our money, and not from Jesus and his kingdom. That chokes his word in our life. And so we stop growing. We stop bearing fruit we were supposed to. We become stagnant. But there's this other one, the worries of the world. In the Greek, it's literally the worry. It's the worry of the age. It's as if Jesus is saying the defining mark of this age is anxiety. Not peace, but the absence of wholeness, of rest. Why? Why is it the worry of this age? Why is that the defining mark? Daryl Johnson will explain. He says, because the age, having excluded the living God from its public life, rests on very insecure foundations. Oh, the age does not think of it this way. It thinks its foundations are quite secure. We are masters of the ship. Why then, for all the bravado, is there this worry, he asks. Because the human spirit implicitly knows that the foundation cannot hold. To be blunt, when the age does not build upon the living God, the age builds on idols. Living God or idols, either or, any age built on idols will be marked by profound worry. For the human spirit implicitly knows idols cannot finally hold it all together. And if the foundation is shaky, the superstructure cannot but wobble. And the wobble sets up this constant state of anxiety. When we build our lives on anything outside of God, we experience this. When we set our hopes on our money or on something else, we experience this wobble, this this shake, this instability, this constant state of anxiety. It's no wonder that just... A few verses earlier, Jesus is saying, if you are tired and heavy laden, burnt out on religion, come to me and I will give you rest. Because what happens when we choose life without reference to God is we ultimately find ourselves in this state of constant anxiety. And it chokes the word of God in our lives. It chokes his message to us. This is also why Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, he'll call anyone who is going to live in his kingdom to not worry about what we will eat or drink, what we'll wear, but instead focus on God's kingdom, being rightly related to him and others. And Jesus says, if when we do that, God takes care of the other things. How many of us are worried, are worried about where we will live? How many of us are worried about getting a better job? Worried about our retirement. Worried about when we'll get to go on our next vacation. How much money we have for that. Worry about how we'll pay for things down the road. Worry about how we'll help our kids. Worry about who's going to take care of us when we need to be cared for at an older age. We worry and we worry. And we worry. And all of this worry and all the other things that we cannot control cause us to experience anxiety, panic even, and paralysis. It stops the growth that God wants in our life. It, it, it seizes us up so that we don't grow into the people God intended for us to become. And I think many times we don't even recognize that this is at work in our lives. We know something's off, but we can't actually fully articulate, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not actually growing in my love for him or for other people. I don't actually have that strong of a desire to be with him, to serve other people, to learn. Those might be signs that something's at work, that something's choking that seed, his word in our life. The worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Watch out. They will choke the new life that God has planted in you when you first understood Jesus. It vies for your heart, for your attention. It tugs at the longings of your heart, and it smothers the work of the Spirit in your life. 
Why don't we see more fruit, in, more fruit of this kingdom in our world? Why don't more people respond? Because of the hardness of hearts, because of shallow hearts, because people's hearts are divided by the worries of this world, by the deceitfulness of riches. None of these conditions lead the heart to do what the seed was designed to do, which is bear fruit. And if we're honest with each other, it's not necessarily that you might just be one of these, but if you're like me, there's a part of you that identifies with each one. That there's parts of my life that feel like it's just this tough soil that doesn't want to hear or come under what Jesus is saying. And that there's other parts that does receive it with joy, but I'm so easily discouraged. And I stop engaging with him. And there's other parts where these other things, the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of riches, they begin to choke out what God would want to do in my life. And yet there's other parts where it is good soil. And I'm seeing fruit. I'm so glad that there's that part of my life. But it's not that there's just one. It might be that there's actually a number of things at work in our lives, different parts of our lives where we are tough and other parts where we're tender. I resonate with all four soils. And so what, what do we do with this if you feel like I do? How do what do we do with Jesus' parables? How can we respond to him? Well, I think it's helpful to think through what is it that Jesus wants? And I think the key is found in verse 19 when Jesus says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it. Which implies that if you do understand it in the way he's talking about this, you will respond. We need to understand his words. That's what his desire is, to understand him. That's what his desire for his disciples is. That's why when his disciples don't understand these parables, they'll come and beg Jesus, could you explain that one? No, that doesn't make any sense to us. And he does. Because he is not trying to be confusing. He wants to make clear and teach his disciples what the kingdom is about. He wants them to hear his words, and he wants us to understand them. But we need to understand what he means by this word, understands. See, this word, understand in Greek, is tsunami. It literally means to put together. And yes, it can refer to, to mentally comprehend. You know, in the way that we might say, it wasn't until I finally put it all together that I was able to understand and move forward. But there's more to it than that. More to it than just a sense of understanding. Jesus means to get in line with, to yield to. You can see an example of this in Ephesians chapter 5 where Paul will tell Christians to not be foolish but to understand the will of God. Don't be foolish but get in line with the will of God. Don't be foolish but yield to the will of God. Jesus wants us to hear his message about the kingdom and get in line with it, to hear his words and yield to them. This is why Dale, uh, Frederick Dale Bruner in his commentary on Matthew suggests that it's worth translating this word or this verb as stand under. Stand under. If you want to understand Jesus' message, you need to come and stand under it. When you hear the message of the kingdom and do not stand under it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in your heart. If you hear Jesus' words, but you refuse to yield to his words, the evil one comes and steals what was planted in your heart. If you hear the voice of God and do not get in line with his message, the evil one comes and takes away the seed that was sown in your heart. One of the things we learn about God in the first pages of the Bible is that when God wants to create, he simply speaks. That his words have this power to create. They are a creative force. And as Jesus comes along, we see him doing something similar. That his, at his words, paralyzed people stand up. They have the ability to stand and walk. That his words have the power to calm storms, to call back people from the dead. At his command, demons are cast out of people and people are set free. People are forgiven like that with his words. 
And yet, Jesus gives this unique honor to human beings in that we have the ability to respond to his words. Don't stand opposed to his words or over his words. Don't even stand beside them. Stand under them. When you yield to his words, when you get in line with his words, when you get in line with his message, something remarkable will happen. This word that comes as a small, gentle seed begins to break the hardness of indifference. It begins to heal and transform the soil of your life from within. When you stand under his words in the face of trouble, even when you don't understand it, Jesus takes all of your shallowness and begins to dig deep and set up roots deep in your heart, deep in your life, taking you deeper into the kingdom life that he came to give you. Get in line with his message and you'll begin to see Jesus clear the clutter out of your life, out of your heart. Watch him train your heart to tune out the voices of worry and the deceitfulness of riches so that the overwhelming sound you learn to hear is his good and gracious words. You'll still hear the other sounds. They'll still be present. They're they're not going to go away. But they won't have the same power over you. When you stand under his words, you'll witness the word of God burst through with the fruit of the Spirit. We went through the fruit of the Spirit in the summer. All these different characteristics, these facets of what the Spirit does and brings about in our lives. All along, God has longed for us to live with Him, to come to Him and walk with Him. And the beauty of this parable is that no matter where you are, Jesus doesn't say that the soil needs to clear the rocks out, that the the soil needs to soften itself up, that the soil needs to weed out the thorns, then you can receive the word. All he asks is that you hear his words and you yield to him, that you hear him and you respond in trust. He's the sower. He can do all the cleaning, pulling out, clearing out, softening, but you need to yield. Get in line with and trust yourself to him. And what can happen in our lives is we're like, I don't understand you, God. Therefore, I won't entrust myself to you. I don't understand what you're saying. Therefore, I can't keep going. And so we stop. And I was reflecting on this in my own life. that, that I, uh, I, at least, I tried a once-a-week journal. And yesterday I opened it up and I saw that two consecutive entries start with, God, I don't understand. And I saw how clearly in both circumstances I was stuck. And part of the reason why I was stuck was because I would not yield myself to him. Because I would not entrust, because I don't understand what he was doing in circumstances and I definitely didn't like them. I found myself resisting still and trusting myself to him, getting in line with who he is. Ironically, in one of the things that came up, I felt the Lord that very day before this challenging event happened in my life, I felt the Lord say, Alex, you are not in control. I am in control, and I am good. And it was as if the Lord was giving me this word before this thing were to come. And it was an invitation to entrust myself to him. There will be things that happen to us in life that we just don't get. We don't understand on the side of heaven. But the call, the desire of Jesus is that we would yield to him. And when we do, when we entrust ourselves to him, he's like, let me clear this out of your life. Let me silence these voices, lower the volume on them. Let me soften your heart. So you can receive the love I have for you and you can give the love I want for you to give. That's the invitation that we have in this message from Jesus. So Father in heaven, we come before you. We come before you because of your son Jesus who spoke your words. He made you known to us and he invites us to know you, 
to call you Father. Because of him, we can be adopted into your family. And so, Lord, we recognize that there are parts of our lives that are like tough soil. And right now, we yield it to you and ask for you to do your work of softening, of tilling the soil of our hearts. By your spirit, we pray. We ask that those, those thorny areas of our lives that are choking out the work you want to do in us, that Jesus, you would lead us. We yield it to you now and ask that you would pull those out. And we commit to trusting you as you do that painful work. Jesus, we ask that you would remove the, the rocky soil, the shallowness there. We want you to dig your roots deep into our lives. So come, Jesus. We want to be like that picture in Psalm 1 of a tree that is planted by streams of water. And its roots are tapping into the streams of living water, your very spirit, God. We want your life in us. So that at the end of our lives, we can look back and say that you turned our hearts into good soil. So we come and ask for you to do the work that you can do in our lives. And we commit to being willing partners in that, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen.